What is a timeless masterpiece fragrance? In my observation, the term masterpiece is thrown around quite flippantly in this community, albeit harmlessly. People often use it to express genuine, deep admiration for a fragrance that smells like nothing else they've ever experienced and just perfectly suits their tastes. Nothing wrong with that. But real quick, let's explore a few of the dictionary definitions for the term masterpiece. A person's greatest piece of work, as in art. Anything done with masterly skill, a masterpiece of improvisation. A consummate example of skill or excellence of any kind, the chef's cake was a masterpiece. And for fun, here's a more antiquated definition. A piece made by a person aspiring to the rank of master in a guild or other craft organization as a proof of competence. So through this lens, the term masterpiece must invariably represent not only the work of art in question, but more importantly, the artist behind it. Here is how I would apply the term masterpiece to fragrances today. This is a bit of a criteria, so to speak. Number one, a unique scent DNA. There's nothing quite like it before it came along, as far as I understand at least, and either it has inspired many fragrances since its release, i.e. it started a trend of some kind, or this fragrance is to this day known to resemble almost nothing else. Number two, the fragrance's popularity is not necessarily determined by high sales in the industry abroad. Obviously money is at play here, but it definitely wins points for longevity on the market and or in the fragrance enthusiast space as well as its impact. What are people saying about it? And number three, it is a timeless scent profile that may not smell bound to the time of its release. Simply put, it smells like it could have been released at any point, whether that is 40 years ago, today, or 20 years from now. Now, I actually did a video like this over two years ago, and I'm not going to do this video exactly like that one. The previous video contained over 25 different fragrances in an effort to cover as much ground as possible. Many of the features in that video were ones that I didn't even have, and some of them were ones I didn't even really care for. Although I put them in the video because I still objectively considered them masterpieces. We're not doing that this time. I'm sticking to a smaller number of fragrances that I actually own and truly enjoy. And that of course meet the criteria. Now this implies that there will be many fragrances that will not be mentioned in this video. There might be ones you would expect to see. So forgive me in advance for leaving a lot of holes here. Hint, hint, if you want to see more of this, go ahead, like, subscribe, and comment so I know. Now, many of you have seen my YouTube short series that I call Timeless Fragrances You Need to Try Before You Die, and I think a lot of you guys have enjoyed that. This is basically an expansion on that series, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's dive into these 14 fragrances. Just for fun, I'm going to list all of these in chronological order from earliest to most recent. The first one up, originally released in the year 1882. Raise your hand if you were around at that time. If you're raising your hand, you're a vampire. Stay away from me. This is from Hubigant. It is Fougere Royale. This is known as the father, the origin of one of the most popular genres in perfumery that is the Fougere, which is also a timeless genre. It is because of this fragrance, well, not this one in particular. It was kind of reorchestrated in 2010 by perfumer Rodrigo Flores Rue. But if it were not for this lineage of fragrance, we would not have so many wonderful Fougere fragrances that we've come to know and love that are still on shelves today. This is the one. I'm not really going to go into too much detail on what this smells like because we've got a lot to get through here. But if you want to know more about what it smells like and more about the Fougere in general, I did a whole video about the history of the Fougere and many offerings I would recommend in that genre. You can check it out up here, so check it out up there. In 1965, Jean-Paul Guerlain introduced the Habit Rouge DNA. Now, once again, it was reorchestrated, I think, in 2003, but the DNA itself came onto the scene, came to be in the mid-60s, and now we still have this fragrance that you can still buy. So its longevity alone shows its impact on the market and just on people and fragrance lovers abroad. Such an iconic scent profile, representative of the Guerlain style, what they call the Guerlainade Accord. It is this creamy, smooth, powdery, floral, but warm, ambery, sweet vibe. It just all comes together as one dense accord, and then they kind of build around it and give it some new identities. This one is made quite masculine by some spicy florals and woods 
and many other things here. It is a very distinctive personality. It's one that not everyone's gonna enjoy. In my opinion, it smells utterly timeless, but I could see some people saying this smells maybe a little bit mature, a little bit too sophisticated, and I totally understand. But I recommend with this fragrance and with any of the fragrances we're gonna talk about that, as it says in the title, you need to try these. Even if you don't love them, and I'm not guaranteeing you're going to love them, get a sample, see for yourself, check it off the list. Maybe you don't like it at first, maybe you love it at first, doesn't matter. At least you know you're broadening your horizon and understanding of perfumery. That's what it takes. A lot of people ask Justin, how did you develop your nose? Exactly as I just described to you. Trying samples of stuff that I didn't even like at the time or I loved at the time. It's all learning. It's all expansion. But that is Hobby Rouge from Guerlain. 1988, we gotta talk about this classic from Dior. This is Fahrenheit, the Eau de Toilette. Some of you guys might consider this to be dated because you have distinctive association with it in terms of other people. And that's a fuzzy line that's maybe kind of another topic for another time to say, does association completely nullify timelessness? I don't know, we're talking about the bounds of human perception. Once again, that's another topic for another time. Not getting into that today, but I do believe that that objectively speaking, this scent profile, the elements that comprise it, definitely did not smell like anything else that came out around this time. And there's been so much that has been influenced by this fragrance since its release. It is this fresh ozonic fragrance, fresh and almost like a green metallic way with an undeniable sweet leather in the background. People say it has this gasoline-like quality. I don't quite get that, I never have. To me, this smells really easy on the nose, but we're all different. Nonetheless, undeniably a timeless masterpiece from the House of Dior. And there were three named perfumers behind it. I'm gonna have to read them because I'm not remembering all of them. Jean-Louis Suiza, Michel Amarok, and Maurice Roger. You're welcome for my impeccable French pronunciation. Moving on. In 1993, Jacques Poles gave us a fantastic and interesting take on the fougere that ultimately carved itself its own place in the genre. If you're asking me, this is from the house of Chanel and we have Platinum Egoist. And it is perfectly named. There is this sharp, fresh, cold, metallic feeling to this otherwise classic style fougere scent. It is in that barbershop vein, so it does represent a little bit more of like that shaving foam vibe, but it's sharp, it's striking, it is definitive. This was not for me when I first smelled it, but I love this now. There's a reason why you can still buy it on shelves. It's a timeless scent profile, obviously the fougere is, but in and of itself, it is its own thing within the genre. I truly do believe that, and I stand by it. Let me know if you dig Chanel Platinum Mega Weiss, and if you have not yet tried it, along with everything else here it's going to be linked down in the description 1995 here bourdon and olivia creed allegedly collaborated I'm going to leave that there to create silver mountain water this fragrance is incredible because i believe that most of you had the same experience i did is that when you first smelled this fragrance you were not aware of when it actually came out you were not aware it was released in the mid 1990s because it doesn't smell like it it smells like nothing that was coming out in the 90s and it still smells undeniably modern today it's an incredible scent profile this was back when creed was making hits this was back before we had the split between designer and niche we just had good quality sincere perfumery happening in different pockets around the world some bigger some smaller metallic fresh tea alpine cooling a little bit fruity in a way but not overly sweet such an incredible scent profile not my favorite in terms of fragrances that smell like it now, but I have to acknowledge that there would be many fragrances that don't exist if it weren't for Creed Silver Mountain Water. What a profile. Jean-Claude Elena, we're gonna see his name again. In 1998, brought us Declaration from Cartier. Now this has spawned several flankers since its inception. It is a profile that on the surface does not seem completely off the wall, completely different. But when you smell it, when you wear it, there is this quality to it that is only itself. It has a very particular face. It is characterized by cardamom and bitter orange, fresh spicy, a little bit bitter and citrusy, backed by woods and other spices. There's a reason why it is one of the few fragrances in its collection to still be manufactured and sold by Cartier themselves. They've gotten rid of so many of the other great flankers, but the OG is still here because it is a timeless masterpiece. That's Declaration from Cartier, make sure you try it. We're into the year 2000, and in 2001, we had from what is now considered a niche perfume brand, from Serge Luton, we had Cher Guy. 
perfumed by Christopher Sheldrake. And this fragrance, once again, when you smell this, I don't say, you know what? This is definitely 2001. I can totally see it. I was definitely wearing my Jabot jeans with my FUBU's on, my massive Mark Echo shirt, sea walking in the club. No, that's no. Shergi is this powdery, ambery tobacco fragrance that is so iconic. The iris is what makes it quite powdery, and that's what might rub some people the wrong way, but there is this honeyed tobacco, warm, rustic, sweet feeling to it. It's very rich, it's very posh, but it's not too intense, which I really appreciate. It wears in a very elegant way. It's very specific, and as I like to say, specificity is polarizing. Some of you guys will smell this, your eyes will widen, and your life will be changed forever. Not in the most vast way, but in a very small way. And some of you guys will try this, immediately pull it away from your nose, and either throw away the test strip or scrub your hand and never speak of it again. Either way, you're right. But we can't deny it's a timeless masterpiece. That is Shergi from Serge Luton. In 2004, from perfumer Bertrand Duchefort, we're gonna see him once again as well. In collaboration with L'Artisan Parfumeur, we have Timbuktu. Man, once again, a fragrance that's not gonna be for everyone because it's very specific, but it is such a unique and outstanding profile. It is very woody, incense a little bit fruity, but in an unripe way. Green mango, there is vetiver, papyrus, incense. It paints a picture in a beautiful way. That being said, I've heard that current formulations are not what they used to be, which is unfortunately a thing these days. So I do have a more vintage bottle. You will not find this bottle very readily. I've heard current bottles, again, are not the same. So maybe go for a decant first, as I always say. You probably have a better chance of it coming from an older bottle. Not guaranteed, but chances are much higher. So if you have not tried Timbuktu, try Timbuktu. And if you have, let people know down in the comments what you think. 2005, we saw the introduction of a eyebrow raising fragrance from the House of Dior. From the nose of Olivier Polge, he brought us Dior Om. Now this is the 2011 reformulation. I cannot compare it to its original 2005 version because I haven't tried the original. It's hard to find, but I think the DNA in this bottle at least is still alive and well. That waxy, powdery iris combined with fresh lavender with a base of leather and cacao almost becomes chocolate leather on the skin. People wonder how this is considered a masculine fragrance or fragrance for men. I don't really question it these days. I do think it carries a certain confidence to it, but I can understand that people won't like this because I hated it when I first tried it. But timeless masterpiece. Tell me I'm wrong. Jean-Claude Elena once again, 2006. He brought us this juggernaut of a fragrance DNA that has proven that time will do nothing to this scent DNA. It will be here for the long haul. This is Terre d'Hermes, the Eau de Toilette. We cannot deny its impact on the community, the awards it's won, the flankers it spawned, the inspirations it spawned. You can't knock it, but it's okay if you don't like it because I used to hate it myself. I love it now. Citrusy, woody vetiver with this fresh musky quality that kind of surrounds it. Undeniably masculine and authoritative but elegant, confident stuff. 2007 was a very special year in perfumery for several reasons. There's a lot of great releases that came out, but there were several that came out all at once from the house of Tom Ford and the newly introduced private blend collection. The one I'm gonna be talking about today is Tuscan Leather. And this is a stalwart collection, several of which are still sold and loved today, over 15 years later. And of course they've added to the collection quite a bit. It was honestly hard for me to find the perfumer or perfumers for for this fragrance, Fragrantica doesn't list it, but Parfumo lists Harry Fremont and Jacques Cavalier. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. I do know that those two collaborated on Noir de Noir together, so it's possible that maybe they did this one as well. Don't know, but you probably know this fragrance already. You might hate it, you might love it. Raspberry leather, smoky, ashy, herbal, sweet, but powerful, brash, a little bit animalic, and definitely a trendsetter. Bertrand du Chauffeur, 2007 once again, for Amouage's 25th anniversary, brought us Jubilation 25. And this is also one that is unfortunately known to be subject to some severe reformulation, so it's not what it used to be, as I've explained in my experience. That's not a problem for me because the original version, which I can objectively say is still truly a masterpiece, was too much for me. But this watered down version is more palatable for me. I do enjoy it more, but 
I can understand why people would be upset, but this is such a special scent profile. It really is a standout from the house of Amouage and it is a hallmark in artistic perfumery without question. Very, very complex, but a beautiful composition that comes together in a very cohesive way. Very resinous, instancy. There's oud, there's blackberry and honey. People say it smells regal. I totally would agree with that. Very elegant stuff. Beautiful to wear for a night out in the cooler months when you're dressed up a little bit more. That is Amouage Jubilation 25. 2010, we saw Creed Aventis. Jean Christophe Herault and Erwin Creed. I'm not going to say anything about it. I think we know the impact this fragrance has had not only on the brand Creed itself, but on the fragrance industry abroad. I don't know if there would be a clone market these days if it weren't for Creed Aventis. Just saying. Maybe that's a topic for another video. And the final one, 2019 release from the nose of Quentin Biche for the house of Marc Antoine Barjois. We had Ganymede. Yes, I consider this to be a timeless masterpiece. In my experience, there was nothing quite like this before its release and it has inspired so much since its release. In fact, it's inspired brands to approach Quentin to make this fragrance for their brand. Just saying. Fresh, ozonic, metallic suede leather. A little bit strange smelling with that immortel note. People say it smells a little bit culinary like maple curry i get what you mean by that but to me this smells like a new car it smells like the interior of a luxury automobile it is so specific it's so definitive i do consider it an iconic profile one that is versatile but you will smell different you will smell provocative as long as you don't overspray because this stuff is really strong anyway that's Ganymede. Let me know what you think. All right, well, that was quite an adventure. I wanna know what you think down in the comments if you've tried any of these fragrances. And once again, as per the mandate of this title, if you have not tried these fragrances, there will be links to try them down in the description. Make this year be the year. I know there's some of you guys who still haven't tried Fahrenheit, which is really odd. I'm not judging you, but go try it and come back and let me know what you think. Nonetheless, thank you so much for tuning in. Peace. I'll see you in the next one.